Peace of the Lord be with you. You may be seated, friends. One of the great things of my life is that I get to walk shoulder to shoulder with, it, with you for a season. College is kind of like a nest. You're here for a little bit, and then you fly away north and south and east and west. And when you walk with you for a season, something happens. You just fall in love over and over again. You don't know this, but like we fall in love with you. We love that when you're here, but even more, we love it when you come back and share your stories with us. One of the people who I love is Olivia Husbands, who's a uh, 2000, that's just dated myself, 19, 2015 grad. Um, and over the summer, she moved to Memphis and started a new life in the Memphis Teacher Residency Program. And I've invited her um, first just to show you, yes, there is life after college. And two, that we could just participate in one of our alum stories of how God is working in her life. So would you please welcome Olivia Husbands. Hi, I'm honored to be here with you, to worship with you, and to share about what the Lord is doing in Memphis. I'm a little nervous because you're a little bigger than my sixth graders. As a senior, there are a swath of emotions and choices that are eminently approaching. Sorry to remind you. Seemingly, the question on everyone's lips are, what are you doing after graduation? While some of you know what is, lies ahead, most of you do not. You are on the cusp of adulthood. It is a weighty and exhilarating place to be. Last fall, I swelled with an indistinct sadness. Leaving hope meant that I would be trading the familiar for the foreign. Amid, in mid-February, senior year, I was still unsure as to what I would be doing after graduation. In the midst of student teaching and applying for teaching jobs, I attended an information session about Memphis teacher residency. One of the greatest injustices in our country lies in urban education. The economically and racially marginalized are unjustly served when it comes to education. The reason for this is laced with complexities and is rooted in over 200 years of injustices and oppression. The urban education system is usually referred to as the prison pipeline. Currently, the government uses third grade reading proficiencies to determine how many prison cells to build. This is deeply unsettling and sinful. As a gospel response to the academic achievement gap in this country, MTR is committed to train culturally competent and spiritually mature teachers who are committed to remain in the public school system in Memphis for four years or beyond. So I prayed and applied and hoped. Weeks after graduation, I packed up in faith and moved to Memphis, Tennessee to begin my residency year. During the residency, I received a master's in urban education, or I will receive a master's in urban education, while teaching in a classroom with a highly qualified mentor teacher. I currently teach in Orange Mound, the oldest African-American suburb in the country. Nestled in Orange Mound lies Sherwood Middle School. Here, I teach 140 students. Most of them are African-American. I want to tell you about my students in a way that is worthy of them, because they are truly brilliant beings who are loved and created by God. Teaching in the inner city is as hard as it is beautiful. My students sit with a stare of simmering resignation. Many of my students are behind grade level. A handful of them are unable to read. Some struggle to make it to school most days. Many of them are fatherless. One is learning to read so that she can teach her mama how. One is a full-time babysitter for his siblings while he helps his mama keep it together. It is both a burden and a privilege to bear witness to our mutual brokenness. In all the chaos that settles and lurks in the halls of Sherwood Middle, there is evidence of grace and dignity at Sherwood. 
Social justice work can at times seem impossible, especially when it is done apart from Christ. In Reconciling All Things by Katangale and Rice, they articulate something that is key in understanding the work of social justice. They write, we are not bringing Christ to the poor communities. He has been active in these communities since the creation of the world, sustaining them by his powerful word. When we enter these communities, we are seeing what reflects the very hand of God. And we're not alone in this work. Nor are we responsible for bringing justice about. Rather, we are invited to be active participants in the work of justice. Amidst the challenges, the reason why I can flourish in this work is because I'm not alone. I am working in the midst of a Christian community. There are 200 other MTR residents and graduates, professors and staff members who will support me through my four years. Nothing is outside of God's authority, power, or lordship. He has dominion over all things, and he is interested in good craftsmanship. So I will work to serve my students well and to teach them rightly. What I do is not brave, noble, or honorable. It is just right. It is not that I'm an urban educator. I teach, it is, I teach a student named Quintaria, and I really care about her. Under the pressure of figuring out who you are, what to major in, and finding a place where you belong, do not lose sight of why you are here. Jesus becoming flesh is the single most important model for the church. If we want to follow Jesus, we need to move in closer to those who have been marginalized in society. So I charge you with this. First, be faithful. Be faithful to the one who has brought you here and has gifted you with the privilege of an excellent education. Be faithful in all things and in all places. And secondly, honor him in all that you do. Could you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for these beautiful students and for the gifts that you've given them. I pray that you would charge them with being faithful to you and that they would want to honor you and serve you with all of their lives. We thank you so much for who you are. Amen. Let's give Olivia love. I want you to imagine, is this working? Yeah. I want you to imagine something. Close your eyes just for a moment. I want you to imagine the most beautiful home you know or would like to know. Maybe it's by Lake Michigan. Maybe it's in the mountains. Maybe it's in the middle of Manhattan. I don't know. But imagine that space, that, that house that is a beautiful inspiring, you would want to live there. You can open your eyes. Now imagine that somebody came to your dorm room and knocked on the door and said, here are the keys to this house. It's yours. Is there a catch? Do I need to do something? No, just take the keys. This house is yours. Now imagine that that house that becomes your home is your soul. Imagine that most beautiful place you want to live is your own soul, that spaciousness inside of your life, that part that only you really know, only you and God know. That soul is expansive and it's beautiful it's inspiring. Imagine that God is giving you the most beautiful place, and it's within. The good news, my friends, is that he has. He has knocked on the door and given you the keys to something that is so beautiful, a home. Because wherever you are, that is your home. That is your place of living. You can never flee yourself. And so if you can make your own soul that most beautiful place, you will always be wealthy. You will always be rich 
no matter where you live, no matter what's in your bank account, if your own soul is beautiful. And the really good news is, is that you can't go out and buy this yourself. You can't buy a, a kit or sign up for some Martha Stewart do-it-yourself project to make the house a better home. It's a gift. God gives us this gift. And what does that soul look like? That's part of what we've been doing this semester as we work through the Sermon on the Mount, as we're in the Beatitudes. A soul that is beautiful to God is a soul that participates in the very life of God. We don't build our own souls. Our souls are made beautiful when we participate in God's own soul. And that soul is seen incarnate in Jesus Christ. That soul we participate in through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And when we participate through the Spirit in Christ's life, our souls become beautiful and they begin to look like this. They begin to look like the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. I want to stop right there, because that's where we're going to be tonight. Verse 5, 6. And so let's just spend some time grooving that deep into our soul. Let's, let's go back a little bit. So each week we're taking one of these verses and trying to get it deep. So re- fill in the blank where you know it. Blessed are the, for theirs is the, so smart. You guys must be on scholarship. The next one, blessed are those who, for they will be, Blessed are the, for they will in, okay, then tonight, repeat after me, blessed. Blessed are those who hunger, who hunger and thirst. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for righteousness, for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. You got it. It's a small verse, but its meaning is large and consequential. God is inviting us to be a people who hunger and who thirst for something particular, something that if we hunger and thirst for, our souls will become Beautiful, because it will be very much reflecting and participating the very soul of God. Last week, a friend and I started a seven-week detox. This has a number of good benefits. I drink more water. I'm eliminating all sugar and carbohydrates from my life. You're all at that age. You, you don't know this yet but you're never going to be more beautiful than you are right now. (laughs) Gentlemen, you are out there. You think you're going to have hair forever. You can eat eat pizza at midnight, and and right now your metabolism can process Tupperware. You don't don't understand what it's like to be 42, middle-aged man in a minivan. What you do is you go on to detox. So my friend and I, we are doing a detox for seven weeks. It's going to lead right up into the Thanksgiving holidays. We're going to feel better about ourselves. We're going to, we're going to lose some of our incarnation. It's going to be awesome. I'm drinking more water. I'm more conscious of what I'm putting into my mouth. I eat out of anxiety, so like if there's stuff there, I'm just like snacking, right? So I'm just trying to break that habit. But one of the big benefits of my detox is I'm craving food. I'm so hungry right now. You have no idea. I just want to eat something big. I, I mean, I'm, I'm like this little rabbit eating all this stuff. The body needs food. And if it doesn't get food, the body starts to shut down and it will crave. But the body doesn't just crave food. 
because the body is more than just our flesh. Our soul also craves something. Our soul craves something for intimacy and meaning and purpose and belonging. And if we don't get these things, we, our bodies, our souls begin to shut down. And we don't become beautiful. We become angry or twisted. Jesus says that we, the word of God says that we don't live by food alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The soul has to be nurtured, my friends. The soul has desires and cravings of its own. And it's important to name that. Because we have to be honest about ourselves, about what we really, really desire. Well, when we go home, and we shut the door to our dorm room or our cottage, and we turn off the lights, and it's just us and God, what are we actually craving? What are we actually really desiring in the innermost parts of our lives? The answer to that question is the answer to your future life. Because what you desire is what you will pursue. Jesus says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Desire is at the heart of everything because it's the deep part of our heart, of our, what the Hebrews called the nephesh, the soul. What is it that you are desiring? Sin, Augustine, fourth century early church father, talked about sin as, as twisted desire. Desire turned in on itself. What, what is it, Mark, in cravatus ense? Is that right? In cravatus ense, it's a big Latin term that means desire turned in on itself. All of the problems that we face, all the horrors that we experience in the world have something to do with that twisted desire. The good news of the gospel is that God wants to untwist those desires. That's what the Beatitudes are trying to do. They're trying to twist our desires back into shape. All of this helps us to save some bad theology. You know I hate some bad theology. I just hate it. I hate it when Christians are preoccupied and then indoctrinated into false ways of thinking. One of the things to understand about um, the incravatus ense, the twisting of desires, is, heals us from what I call the bad theology, theology of the devil made me do it. Do you know this? I cheated because the devil made me do it. I had that affair because the devil made me do it. The devil has so much power over us that it makes us to do things. That's just bad theology. It suggests that there is this yin and yang, good versus evil, that are equally in competition with each other, but that's not true. We believe that God created all things, and God created all things good, which means that God couldn't have created evil. God created creatures that have a will that have the power not to listen to God. And when we don't listen to God, something good that God created gets twisted and perverted. You see what I'm saying? There is, no indivi- there is no independent evil out there roaming around that's going to rival God. God has overcome evil. God has, over all things, God is sovereign. But what has happened is those good things that God has made, they have been twisted and perverted. The devil, by tradition, is an angel that God created beautiful. And he wanted to be God. And something beautiful became polluted and distorted and becomes that kind of evil. And that kind of evil can become institutionalized. It can become codified. It can become supported. And what Jesus came to do is to free us from that kind of perversion, that kind of twisting of evil. What do you really, really desire in your innermost being? But the more important question is, what does God really desire for you? The gospel is an invitation to a life where we desperately desire the right things in our inner life, where you crave the right things, the good things, the beautiful things, what Jesus calls righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and who thirst for righteousness. 
In the Bible, righteousness at least has three different meanings. There's the legal, the moral, and the social. The legal definition of righteousness has to do with what Paul might talk about when he says that we have been made righteous in Christ. How do we become, how do we become justified with God? How, does our, how do we earn a right relationship with God? The answer is you can't earn a right relationship with God. The only way as sinful creatures that we can have a right relationship is if God restores that relationship. And that relationship has been, has been accomplished in the person of Christ. In theology, we're going to use terms like justification. We're going to use words like the mystery of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. All of these things point to the fact that we can't be made righteous on our own. But our righteousness belongs to another, Jesus Christ, God's own Son. And through faith, by believing in Him, we have been justified by the blood of the cross once and for all. And there's the moral. You know, if anyone ever says to you, that dude is righteous, it speaks to somebody who's got an inner character, a conduct, an integrity where one's beliefs and one's actions come together. We call, might call that integrity. One of my favorite movies is an old movie called Rob Roy, and there's this line in Rob Roy where he's teaching his sons about integrity, and he tells it, his son asks him, Father, what's integrity? And Rob Roy, the father, says, integrity is the gift a man gives himself. Righteousness, a kind of a habit of character, of being, that comes as a result of being made right with God. Now, Jesus, we have to be careful, is always, always uh, warning us about a self-righteousness. He warns us not to have the righteousness of the Pharisees, that is just trusting in their legal processes and their law. You have heard it said that you shall not murder, but I say to you that anyone who's angry with a brother or sister, don't put your righteousness in your own moral behavior. May your righteousness be in desiring the right things. But then there's the more pertinent, and I think this is more to the point of what Matthew is talking about in his gospel here in these Beatitudes, the social. The righteousness in the third sense in the Bible has to do with social implications. Our relationships, our institutions, our politics, the way we organize and imagine society. When Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, at least in the context of Matthew's gospel, he is saying, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for, the, for relationships socially. The term that might be best help explain what righteousness means here is justice. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be filled. For they will be filled. The biblical idea of righteousness in this sense means more than a private, personal affair. It includes the social righteousness in society as a whole. The Christian life is not meant to be a cul-de-sac of our own inner being, but always looking outward. Jesus pushes us out into dark places so that we might be light, that we might, in his name, be hands and feet that wash the feet of others. That means that we have to have an imagination and we have to have a competency that is able to go out into society and to engage the social ills of this world. Blessed are those. Blessed are those who hunger and who thirst for righteousness, for social justice, for they will be filled. One of the things that has happened to me on my detox is that I imagine food all the time right now. These cravings trigger pictures of the great American burger with cheese on top. Because when you hunger and thirst and crave for something, you think about it. You imagine it. One of the things that I love about the body of Christ is listening to how people imagine what this verse means. We just heard it for Olivia. She imagined it as a teacher going into a place that is hard but is beautiful about how to be a Christian faithfully in that place. Some of you are going to be engineers and you need to imagine what it's going to be like to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Some of you are going to be lawyers. 
Some of you are going to be homemakers. Some of you are going to be fathers. Some of you are going to be professors. Some of you are going to be preachers. You're going to go out into the world to do something. And you need to prepare yourself, your mind and imagination of what that might be like to hunger and to thirst for righteousness. One of my best friends and dearest colleagues at Hope College is Dr. Mark Husbands. He's imagined a program that might take that verse seriously and shape us as, a, as people and as a community to hunger and thirst for righteousness. And I've invited him to share a little bit about his imagination for you and for this campus. Would you please welcome Dr. Husbands? So the trigger has given us a lot. I think um, when you say grace at your next meal, I want to invite you to pray for trigger. Pray that Trig will be full, <laughs> that he will not hunger, that he will not thirst, that God will meet his needs, and that he will be at peace. Brothers and sisters in Christ, hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Here's a trick. I do think when I was your age, my church had helped me in remarkable ways. They had encouraged me to love Christ. They encouraged me to read my Bible. They encouraged me to pray. They encouraged me to worship. Although, to be honest, I did not have the kind of worship you have here. I would have been a much happier young man if I had had the gatherings. But they taught me to love God, and in a way they gave me a very clear sense of a vertical relationship. My Christian faith was with a God who loved me. What my Christian upbringing had not helped me do was to connect that to the kind of horizontal. And I can't be alone. That must be hard for each of you in some way. How is your love of God connected to your day-to-day -day life wherever you go? And this passage that we just get to think about tonight is an important passage. It helps us in immense ways. In order to make sense of it, I want to think just a little bit about this word righteousness that Trigg has talked about. In everyday English, when we hear the word righteousness, we tend to think that it means moral perfection or being right with God in your soul. And then when we think, well, what does it mean for someone to think that they're righteous? We tend to be a bit nervous at that point, don't we? Because if someone thinks they're righteous, is it that they think they're better than us? Better than you? Better than me? Closer to God? And the trouble with that vision of the word righteousness is it has a long history. And if we were to look over the history of our Christian faith, that's pretty much the way it works out. Righteousness, particularly in the West, is thought to be an individual, personal, interior quality of holiness. But I think I want to introduce you to a problem. If you had your Bible open, and we're here at Matthew 5, 6, and you read four verses on, you would come across this. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Can you get in trouble for what you think? For the inner character of your soul? If you're righteous, and righteous is about your interior life, and you don't share that with anyone, would anyone be upset with you? That's the issue, isn't it? it? It can't possibly be the case that if you are righteous, people are going to persecute you. Unless righteousness has to do with something public, something that others can see, something open to the world, particularly something that would be problematic for people who want to persecute Christians. 
So you might be asking, this word righteousness, what does it mean? And Trigvi has helped us already. I'm glad you asked. It's a great question. What did righteousness mean in the Greek Old and New Testaments? If you know how to read the Bible in Spanish or Latin, maybe even French, you're already farther ahead. See, the Greek word is dikaiosune. I love it when Paul, by the way, comes to chapel and then he tells you these foreign words and then makes you say them and everything. It's just great. It's a great way to involve you. I won't make you say it, but it's dikaiosune. That's the Greek word. But look at these other translations of this. In Latin, justicia. In Spanish, justicia. In French, justice. And in English, justice. And so if Matthew 5.10 should be more accurately translated, blessed are those who are persecuted because of justice. In other words, for doing justice. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Then I think we should also translate Matthew 5, 6 the same way. So instead of this, it should be this. So now that we've established the proper meaning of the translation, I want to leave you with three things before we move towards the table. First of all, justice is at the heart of God. Remember my story about when I was your age, I had a very clear vertical relationship with God. I didn't know how my faith connected to the horizontal. Now, of course, you can't think, well, Professor Husbands, you knew the, the greatest commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and body, and love your neighbor as yourself. I knew that, but I really didn't know how those two things fit together. It turns out that if God reveals something about himself, you should pay attention. If God shows you what he loves, you should probably love that. And in Matthew 5, 6, we're learning what God loves. Now, justice. Why is that a funny word? Because I do think we're, we misunderstand it. And I don't think we should rush to the table until we get it right. You see, the justice of God is not that God loves punishing people. God loves the world that he has made. God has known from eternity your very name. God loves you, each of you. He does not take joy in punishment. That's not the kind of justice we're talking about. To say that God loves and brings about justice is to speak of a very different thing. This kind of justice is intensely focused upon restoration, healing, deliverance, reconciliation, peace, shalom. When the Old Testament writers say that God loves justice, they do not mean that God loves seeing you punished. No, the kind of justice they speak of is a justice not of retribution, but of restoration. Look at one, Psalm 146. This is a clearest witness of many we could find to show that justice is true of God. It's what he loves. It's what he does. The opening verse, he is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. The faithfulness of God is on display when he doesn't abandon what he has made. One of the songs we sang, a beautiful song, was, as your child, if I tell you lies, what will you do? God does not abandon you. God loves you. He loves the whole world. And his justice is an expression of his love. Love for a world that has rebelled against God has sinned, has run away from God, has tried to run the world by itself. God still loves it and remains faithful. What does his justice look like? He upholds the cause of the oppressed, gives food to the hungry, the Lord sets prisoners free, the Lord gives sight to the blind, 
The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner, sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. And just imagine if you were day to day a colleague of Livia and you were working with children, many of whom do not know their father. What comfort would this bring to you that God takes up the cause of the fatherless? The psalmist reveals that the creator of heaven and earth is faithful to all that he has made. In fact, he's faithful in remarkable ways to what's called the quartet of the vulnerable. Who is the quartet? The oppressed, the poor, the vulnerable, widows, orphans. The list is large. God loves them, and he acts on their behalf. So justice is at the heart of God, but how does it involve you? In hungering and thirsting for justice, you are sharing in the mission of God. What does this mean for us? Nearly a billion people entered the 21st century unable to read a book or sign their name. 15% of the world's population currently lives in extreme poverty, living on less than $1.25 a day. 1.5 billion people in the world do not have access to medical care. 17,000 children die today because of poverty. 17,000 children will die tomorrow, and the day after, and the day after. Doing justice is to share in the mission of God. When Jesus proclaims his blessings upon those who hunger and thirst for justice, what does this mean? At its most basic level, it means that God cares for the vulnerable and the poor. And when 2.2 billion people live in extreme poverty, Christians believe that God seeks to deliver them from hardship. In Psalm 140, we hear the declaration, I know the Lord secures justice for the poor and upholds the cause of the needy. Some of you may be struggling with calling. In the midst of worrying about choosing the right major, or write majors or minors, figuring out where to study abroad if you can, sorting out um, a dating partner. Some relationships last quite long at hope, some dramatically short. So what does Jesus' teaching about hunger and thirsting after righteousness have to do with all of this? It turns out that by learning how to love the very things that God loves, the very things that lie at the center of God's concern. Your life begins to take a particular shape. Put differently, how will God secure justice for the poor and uphold the cause of the needy, the foreigner, the orphan? The answer is remarkably clear, through you. This is where the glory of a liberal arts education truly comes to the fore. You do not yet know how learning statistics, English literature, poetry, ceramics, dance, biochemistry, you may have no idea yet how God is going to use that to meet the needs of the poor. But God can. And if you're open to this, God will. You see, when we look at the Sermon on the Mount, a remarkable picture becomes clear. It's Micah 6.8, lies behind it. He has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? Whenever you're stuck about your direction in life, I want you to find your way to, Matthew, or to Micah 6.8. Ask yourself how your gifts and abilities, energy, personality, passion, may be used by God. Offer all that you are back to God for his blessing. It turns out 
some of the most important questions about your identity, calling, mission, and purpose are captured in this verse. So let's return briefly to the Sermon on the Mount. Three things come into focus. Divine justice is not primarily about anger or punishment, but about divine love and faithfulness. So don't run away from the word justice. Justice is good news, good news for the poor and the broken. It's also good news for you. God's calling is clear. We are to do justice. In fact, that's precisely how we hunger and thirst for the kingdom of God. Those who share in the mission of God and who seek to do justice receive the blessings of God. You see, when I was struggling to live this way with God, I did not know that he would be with me when I traveled this way. Those who share in the mission of God, Olivia has noted that God, of course, was already there in Memphis before she came. And if you're struggling with where will you go, it is a great joy to know that God is already on mission. He has already found his way to the place where you shall find your way. And he is already at work. The final thing I want to leave you with is this. You should not seek to do any of this alone. You were never called to follow Christ by yourself. Jesus teaches, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, and he did not address this in the singular. There is the word those. The work of justice can be challenging. It can also be joyful and life-giving, and you should share that joy with others. You will need their gifts, their commitments, their nurture, their care for you, their support. God, God has gifted you with them, and you were called to play a part together in the mission of the church. So why have I been invited to be here, apart from the fact that I knew what Dikaiasune was, and in Curvitus and Say, and peripheral bits of knowledge like that? It's because I'm so privileged to direct a program at Hope College called the Emmaus Scholars Program. Yes, there's some people here who know it firsthand. It's an intentional Christian community focused on faith, learning, and justice. Put differently, it's holding together things that I yearn to hold together, Jesus and justice. Olivia is this probably one of the greatest, apart from my wife, one of the greatest testimonies in my life that God is far too kind and gracious to me. It is a, a remarkable thing to have your daughter uh, speak so movingly of God's provision. And if you remember what she said 20 minutes or so ago, she said you shouldn't try to do justice without Jesus. Those needs of the world that I talked about, 17,000 children dying today, that will ruin you if you try to conceive of that without Christ. It will break your heart and you will end up in despair. How could you not? That is so, so painful. And yet, if you have Christ and the body of Christ and the spirit, you have not only hope, but you have the resources necessary to live a life that's going to make a difference for families and children. I would love for you to have the opportunity to be part of a community while at Hope that would nurture you in all of this. If you find this way of unpacking a verse fascinating, encouraging, cheerful, I want to do that with you for the whole year. And one way for you to do that is to learn to live with others in such a way that you can do justice. So tomorrow evening, Paul, Lauren and I will be at Keppel House and uh, we invite you to come for pizza and we'll teach you a little bit about the Mayor Scholars Program, walk you through what this could mean for you for next year. Uh, if you're a 
freshman, sophomore, junior, you're all welcome. Seniors, I wish I had known you earlier. And Tuesday evening, if you were saying, well, I wonder where would I live? What would this look like? We have an open house. The address is there, and we invite you to come. Uh, Froyo and um, Buffalo Wild Wings. I was told that would be really quite attractive. <laughs> and so why the name Emmaus? Uh, well, you need a name, but it's a fantastic name. You see, Jesus is risen from the dead. He's walking along a road, and he comes across some men, and he begins to talk to them, and they are sad. They are grieving the loss of their Messiah. And so he walks them through passages of the Old Testament. And then he disappears. And they say, were not our hearts burning within us when he showed us the scriptures? They still had no idea who he was. There's a painter named Caravaggio. In 1601, he paints the moment where Jesus is sitting down at a table with these same people. They still do not know who he is until this moment. And my favorite one is this man here. He's, re he's just noticed that this is Jesus. Jesus has broken bread and is offering it to them, and then he sees it is Christ, the risen Lord. It's a fantastic painting. The Mayo Scholars Program is to be a program where, in fact, we want you to continually be moved by the way Christ shows up. The risen Lord appears in our lives in dramatic ways. We eat dinner together every Sunday night. And as wonderful as that is, it's not nearly as wonderful as the meal you're about to have. The road to Emmaus, Christ shows up and he breaks bread. Christ will show up as we break bread. And I pray that not only will you be fed by the, the body and blood of Christ, but that having been fed, Christ will continue to deepen your hunger and thirst for righteousness. Thank you.